It's the Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers, and joining us this week on very short notice, and we're eternally grateful to her, is Ellen McSweeney. She is a violinist and educator, a member of Chicago Q Ensemble, and founding member of Parlor Tapes Plus, and we're going to learn a lot more about that as we go along. Ellen, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, guys. I'm excited to be on the show. Thanks. Oh, and I forgot to mention, she is a New Music Box editor for Chicago. And we featured many of her pieces on the show, and I'm sure we'll get around to talking about that, too. Um, Ellen, uh, one of the first things we wanted to talk about is um, just you as a player and the things that you've got going on and coming up right now. Chicago Q Ensemble has been in existence now for how long? It's been about three years. Um... Yeah, in, in various instances. We actually started out as a quintet um, and then sort of settled into into being a string quartet. So, um, yeah. Okay. Nice. And you guys have some releases out? Yeah, we, we've we focused a lot on the music of Chicago composers um, ever since we sort of got going. There's just a, a ton of great people here and kind of a chance to really work closely together and um, work with composers on a really personal level is something we really value. So the two releases we have out are uh, music of Amy Wirtz, um, both of her string quartets, which is kind of um, a more classic you know, album of string quartets. And then um, we have an album of Kyle Vector's music. Um, and Kyle is a really cool composer who, um, the music is from Fjords, which is a show we did with his theater company, Manual Cinema. And they're actually in New York right now, Patrick. Um, Manual Cinema is in New York for the for the Fringe Festival, yeah. But um, so we collaborated with this shadow puppet company, and Kyle's score is is really great. So that's the second album. It's an album of his like score from the show. Great. Yeah. Very cool. So, and you guys, the ensemble is also into uh, like community outreach education activity. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We have a, um, we're planning this year on kind of like a neighborhood storefront residency. That's kind of our next thing um, coming up that we're planning. So yeah, trying to bring contemporary music into um, settings where it doesn't normally go. And we've found, I mean, we're all string players. So, you know, the standard canon is huge. We could just play standard rep until, you know, we died and, and never run out. And that's super fortunate. But we've actually found that the contemporary stuff seems to get some of the strongest and best reactions from totally uninitiated audiences. Mm -hmm. So when we saw that, we really took it and, and ran with it. And, and um, it's been a lot of fun to introduce different languages, different sound languages to kids and, you know, community music schools and stuff like that. Um, we had several people from the Chicago area on the show, and there uh, is sort of a pride in the so-called third coast. Um, <laughs> and and I, one of my pet peeves is, is always pointing out that music and new music and art that's worth listening to or paying attention to comes from other places besides New York, Patrick. <laughs> um, I, you're putting words in my mouth, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so do you, do you feel that kind of uh, strong fealty to the area in which you live and, and want to highlight what's going on in Chicago? Um, I guess I do. Um, but like I was telling you guys earlier, I, I am from the East Coast, but I didn't really fall in love with contemporary music and all of its possibilities until I moved to Chicago. So I'm kind of a Chicago contemporary music convert. You know what I mean? It was It was sort of the scene in this city that really turned me on to being a, a contemporary music player. Um, so I guess in a sense, I definitely do have a fealty to that. Um, and it was funny, this summer I traveled to London um, among other places and saw some things going on with contemporary music there and loved it. Um, and of course, that's a huge scene that I could never wrap my head around. But it did make me feel um, like the Chicago scene is special, you know, in its own way. and. Yeah, I think it's a great place. It's a it's a really affordable place to live. So I feel like maybe artists here are maybe they have a little more freedom to take risks or experiment or just kind of I don't know, maybe we're less stressed. <laughs> I have no idea. I've never lived in another major city, but there's kind of a nice sense of space and sense of experimentation that I think is here. Yeah. I'm curious about this uh this 
the storefront residency that you mentioned. Explain yes. explain exactly w- what that is. I'm I'm not in, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure what that would entail, but it sounds but it very sounds, interesting. It sounds groovy. Yeah, you know what? We're not totally sure what it's going to entail either. We got a small grant from a foundation here in Chicago called the Cliff, Cliff Dwellers Arts Foundation. So we're kind of still putting it in development. Um, I mean, as you guys probably have in each of your cities, particularly since the recession and sort of the real estate crash, there are quite a few spots in Chicago, even in neighborhoods that are generally doing well, where storefronts are empty. And there is an a couple of organizations that basically put visual art in those storefronts until something comes to fill them. Um, And so we had the idea that we would just basically rehearse in one of these storefronts for a period of time, like a week or a month, that we might like put some light amplification out like onto the sidewalk so that people wanted to come sort of sit on the sidewalk and watch and listen, that they could do that. Um, And that we would do pop-up shows in stores and coffee shops and stuff in the neighborhood because Chicago is kind of has the whole city of neighborhoods thing going on. That's something the city is really proud of. It's like, what part of the city are you from? And so we kind of wanted to play on that. So that's where we still have it in development. It's very much like a new thing that we're starting to think about. Yeah. Well, after that happens, I want to have you back on the show because that sounds fantastic. <laughs> the quartet in Providence, Rhode Island, the Providence String Quartet, which like their permanent home is a storefront. And I think they do that. So the idea is not not original. I, I think the work they do in the community is really, really cool. I wanted to do a mini version of that. They've been around a really long time and have, you know, they're a real organization that's right. quite a, but yeah. Well, you know, good artists borrow and great artists <laughs> steal out, right? I think so, I read that somewhere. Uh, I think I heard it on yeah, the West right. I think I, I think I heard it on NPR. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Ellen, the other big thing we really wanted to talk to you about, and, and I'm going to quote Dave because I think that you'll like this. Dave and I were chatting before the show started up, and he said, parlor tapes plus music sounds like the thing that I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> so why don't you tell us how this, uh, how this uh, what's described as the first and only contemporary art music uh, focused record label and media collective in Chicago. Tell us how this got started and what you guys are up to. Well, I think the, the, the first two people that started chatting about it were Jenna Lyle, who's a really wonderful composer and vocalist here in Chicago, and Kyle Vector, who's a composer and producer and quite a good recording engineer. Um, Kyle is kind of an amazing, like, renaissance man, jack of all trades, do all things guy. And the two of them kind of hit it off and started talking about, um, Kyle, I think, has had this idea for quite a while. The idea that making recordings for contemporary music ensembles and for composers is a little bit of a broken system right now, that the expense is really, really high. The lag time between like a piece getting written and all the excitement that surrounds that and then getting a recording out to people just feels really long and slow and expensive and bureaucratic. I don't know if I'm putting words in Kyle's mouth, but um, he wanted to find a way to just make it faster and better and more accessible to a, a bigger pool of artists and so that's part of where the tape comes in it's a lot cheaper to produce um so so that was the first impetus but then I was also feeling like the contemporary music media kind of needed in Chicago a bit of a facelift maybe a bit more of a sense of humor sense of experimentation and so um yeah those were some of the things as we like surveyed our artistic community that we felt like we're missing that we wanted to bring with parlor tapes. So um, it's Kyle and Jenna and myself, and then this really interesting blogger and and artist and composer named Andrew Tom. I don't know if you guys, he has a Tumblr, it's called An Ear Alone, and um, he's really great. And our fifth member is, is Deidre Huckabee, who's a flutist and an arts administrator in town. Um, yeah, I was looking at your uh, first releases coming up are gonna be uh, Spectral Quartet's debut album, and that was a good get. 
and a multi-city collaborative mixtape called, I don't know, Asterisk and, I don't know exactly how you put voice to that name. Um, can you yeah. tell us about these initial projects? Yeah, um, well, Spectral Quartet has just been kicking butt ever since they formed and are just an amazing group of musicians, super duper hardworking and enterprising. And um, so releasing their debut felt like a really exciting first release for us as a Chicago label. Um, and so that, you know, that's one thing. And But then I guess for the five of us, we were also interested in kind of serving as curators and having the label be more than just sort of, you know, here's an ensemble, let's put out their release, but having an identity as a label and getting a chance to do creative projects as a label. So that's more what the AND project represents. And it's 10 Chicago musicians. We asked them each to contribute about five minutes of audio in collaboration with an artist in another city. So there are artists from New York and London and all over the place who will be um, on the mixtape. Yeah. Cool. You know, you, you, speaking more about Chicago, it sounds like um, I, I th we've talked to a number of people of Chicago on this show, and I'd say many of them have a real vested interest in the community of Chicago. Um, you know, making sure that Chicago musicians are included, even if it's a collaborative culture project like you're talking about that's multi-city there's like this effort to really push chicago um do you feel that in all of the projects that you do i, I mean is that like something important for you to the, the community the culture in that area i it's funny i mean me it's a bit yeah there's just a lot of hometown i of like how the how the sports fans are they're like really really <laughs> hardcore <laughs> the, the music musicians are the same um no I, I do think that it's a sense that a rising tide like lifts all the boats here and i think we have hard evidence that working together is maybe more productive than than not um and that it just yields a lot of really good things creatively. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how that happened or why uh, it's like that. Yeah, it's like a Midwestern I, congeniality. I don't know, <laughs> but it's, it's, I think it's very creatively productive. I think at the end of the day, it just leads to more better art and you know music getting made here. But yeah, there is a little bit of that hometown pride. It's funny. Yeah. yeah. Um, a real quick aside or a non sequitur, um, Cubs or White Sox? Red Sox. You're gonna, oh, <laughs> you're, gonna alien, you're gonna alienate yourself yourself to half of Chicago now. Oh, I know. awful! It's awful to be a Boston sports fan, like oh, anyway. It didn't. This didn't even take. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a little bit tough. I live I, so basically. I'm totally impartial. I mean, I can't. I won't even speak to this question. But Jay Cutler <laughs> and I graduated from Vanderbilt the same year. So I have, a, I do have a sense of closeness to the bears. Um, ah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I see that you're you're also planning on putting out a uh, a quarterly online magazine with uh, you know interactive media and media and is there a, a hard and fast plans about what shape that's going to take yet or and is there an issue pending? There, you know what? It's so funny what is not on our website, but what has emerged as maybe the thing that Parlor Tapes is kind of special at is throwing these really weird concert events. Um, and it's funny because we started out thinking about the magazine, but the events, the live events have really taken over. And we're five volunteers, so I'm sure you guys sympathize with this. Um, <laughs> you sort of allocate your resources accordingly. I think the magazine is going to happen, but we've really got the bug of throwing these really weird concerts. The first concert we threw was a murder mystery party. And the second concert we threw was a, um, a job fair, like a corporate job fair. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> just put, putting a really unexpected frame around performances of contemporary music and including like video and dialogue and 
um, people in character has become a really big thing. And we have gotten really, really into that. So we're already brainstorming what like the theme of the Spectral Quartet release party is gonna be and trying to convince them to let it be like love letters or time capsules or something. We've, we've gotten really, really into throwing parties, which which sounds kind of shallow, but it's, <laughs> it's, cre it's created a concert kind of event that I haven't been to before kind of wacky and cool so that's where our emphasis is right now and so i think the magazine's going to embody that kind of spirit sort of wacky um and fun and um but casting an unexpected light on, on some of what we're doing as a community so i i really think that's a fantastic idea it gives it it's a a very obvious and um community engaged idea of how to uh, build excitement around an event. Um, you're talking about the, uh, your job fair on the front page of the, of parlortapes.com is a sort of a flyer for this uh, faux. <laughs> it's called international uh, job employment expo. And I love this kind of thing, this kind of uh, nonsense text. <laughs> I'm going to read the first sentence because this is, I want to know who wrote this. A long-established, fact-based, high-quality, and next-level parlor type A deepens a future scalable, omni-channel, and interconnected selectivity, which is, I don't even think is a grammatically correct sentence and is complete nonsense, but it's really cool and has its own sort of music. So who came up with this, I'm wondering? Um, it's super funny. I actually have on my blog a little blog post from recently. It's called Idea Storms, and it's about the process of coming up with ideas with these crazy folks that I work with at Parlor Tapes. There is somehow a sense, I think I might be the most conservative person on the team in the sense that when someone is like, I have an idea, let's throw a job fair and pretend that it's hosted by our sister company, Parlor Taipei. And I'll be at the meeting and I'll say, oh my God, this is going to fall flat on its face. This is, I'm not sure this is going to work. And somehow my, my comrades will just totally convince me that it's going to work. And then two months later, I'm at a concert and the whole audience is doing like a team building exercise and having an absolute. There's, there's a lot of risk taking and not being afraid to look really, really stupid. I feel like that's one of the number one ingredients of, of parlor tapes is not being afraid to take a really big risk and maybe fail in a major, major way. Um, yes, to that's, pay off. That's really I interesting. Was... I wonder how. So you you have all these different enterprises, and Sam mentioned the 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 plans for the magazine thing. I wonder how you take the idea of not being afraid to really spectacularly fail at something like this. You know, a a job fair slash concert thing. How do you take that in and apply it to these other projects? How do you apply it to an album even? Um, uh, 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 so I guess what I'm asking is how these different parts of this Parlor Tapes Plus project inform one another. Well, that's a really good question because with a magazine or with a record, there's such a strong uh, history of like what that thing is. Mm -hmm. Like here's what is like here's what a magazine should be and I guess that's true of concerts too I mean obviously we have some pretty strong ideas of what a concert is also um, so I guess it's a sense of trust particularly with the collaborative mixtape I mean it's like you choose people that you feel like are great artists and then you just let them do what they want to do and right. trust them and, and don't meddle too much maybe just be like I trust you to make great stuff go and um, and then you, maybe you get better results that way. So yeah, maybe it's a sense of trust in everyone that we're involved with, whether it's a writer that we bring on to the magazine or somebody that we ask to contribute five minutes of sound. We don't, um, yeah, we believe in them. <laughs> in <a cheese. laughs> yeah, maybe that's what it is. Do you think you can you can like reimagine a magazine or, or, or a record the same way that you have done for a concert? in such a radical way? I really, really hope so. It's funny because as you guys know, like I write for New Music Box and I really like to blog and I write about stuff that's not just contemporary music. I write about personal life and um, grief and 
you know, all kinds of feelings stuff. And I recently, um, <clears throat> I recently started like a subscription series where if you subscribe, I will write you a letter every week that feels like a secret letter. So I just found this one on Friday and that, um, and I mean, I'm writing the same letter to, to all the subscribers. I'm not writing 34 letters because I have 34. <laughs> and so, so that, that's maybe a way that I could envision the magazine going. It's like unexpected formats um, that feel really personal. I mean, lit literary forms that feel really personal is what's important to me, how that's going to come together with Parlor Tape. Parlor Tape has a pretty serious sense of humor, um, <laughs> serious. <clears throat> uh, so yeah maybe something like that i don't know um but i'm i'm excited to take some risks with those forms and also the fact that it's an online magazine and online form um yeah, yeah. well that sounds really interesting and it's it, it, it so what you're doing with parlor tape strikes me as particularly interdisciplinary in in that you, this this um you know the 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 job expo is kind of an act of theater as much as it is anything else and you're talking now about the, the things that you write with words and it's it's really interesting to me that we we see more and more musicians and composers that are not you know limiting themselves to like the one thing that they do is to write notes on a staff or play the violin really well um so it's really exciting to see all of these different uh, artistic disciplines coming together. Do you, at, at either with, with your personal projects or with parlor tapes or any of these other things, uh, do you see yourself going out and finding not just interdisciplinary artists like yourself, but specialists in those other areas, sculptors and painters and choreographers and things like that? Yeah, I mean, you make such a good point. And definitely for me, I mean, becoming a violinist was such a slow process and like accepting that that was actually what I was going to do. I mean, it took me like 20 years to actually commit to the violin, even though I was really, I was always serious, but some part of me always had my hand in like three other pies, like writing or doing labor organizing or whatever stuff I was doing at the time. Um. I think I I do think that the emphasis on specialization is maybe unhealthy. Like I feel like some musicians end up feeling like I have to do this and only this and there's no room for anything else in my life and if I can't do that I should quit. There's these two really strong extremes. Like I'm either going to be a violinist and slave over that or I'm going to like stop playing entirely. I mean so many people stop playing entirely. I think they people maybe feel like there's not room for their whole selves in the field of like music performance. I don't know about composers if you guys feel that way, but I sometimes felt like the role of violinist was too small for what I wanted to do and who I was. And it took a long time to figure out like, Oh, I don't have to do just that. Yeah. I can, I can help put on these concerts that are theatrical and help write the dialogue or um, I think it's really empowering to realize that there's there's more space than you thought um yeah but i don't know i what so what you're saying dave is like should should the specialists kind of come together yeah well and, or, or or i'm if you're reaching out because i think I, maybe i'm putting words in your mouth but if you if 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 somebody asked you at like a cocktail party what it is that you do you would probably start off by saying that you're a violinist right i or, would but what about people that would start off by saying that they're a choreographer or a writer or a sculptor or whatever? Right, right. Well, I think it is so exciting for anyone who's kind of living in a small world to get a chance to just like blow that world up and do something. <laughs> yeah. You know? I just participated with um, a couple, I just did my first live improvised show in Chicago. I, I used to improvise a long time ago. And then again, because of specialization, right? Where it's like, I've been funneled into like fully notated music, fully notated music. And if, a few nights ago, I did my first improvised show in years and it was with these dancers. And you could just sense that like the dancers 
thrilled. They haven't played like violin, clarinet, and voice improvising on stage. They were super energized. We were stunned by what they were doing. It was this freaky Japanese style of dance that was totally freaking me out and in a good way. And there's so much energy created by that. The series is called Collision Theory, which I think is a really good name because it's sort of like, well, what happens when, when these things collide? And yeah. So I think openness to, to letting, your, letting your boundaries be totally, um, totally exploded is, is really positive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one thing that I always feel when I start to engage in those kinds of things, and I think it is a little bit different for composers. In, I think it's a, it's a little bit easier for composers to do those sorts of things because I think there's this assumption, and, and Sam or Patrick, correct me if, if, if you feel differently, there's an assumption that composers by default have a little bit more agency over the thing that they make and and that performers uh are more like i don't know in interpreting this thing that somebody else made which is obviously bs but i think that's kind of the way that we all grew up studying music um but i always feel when i embark on these projects that involve me doing other things I feel a little bit like a dilettante. Like there are people that do those things and they've been like practicing doing them for years and years and years. And I feel like they look at that and they're like, oh, that's cute. Here's how grownups do what you're trying to do. <laughs> do you ever feel that way? I'm curious to hear from you guys. As um, well, I think I mean, speaking to your earlier question or the point that you brought up Dave earlier, um, I think it matter. I mean, it's a loaded question because it goes with like instrumentation sure. and relationships and things like that. Like, it's very. I I very much agree with you if you're writing a piece for solo saxophone or whatever it may be. Um, if you're writing an oratorio, I mean, th there there is a cutoff point to which you can't take everyone's input. You know, right? But I you mean, have a you, music director still, right? You do. You do. But, I mean, like, if it's a multi, yeah, I mean, like, if there's one, if there's one kind of instrument, I suppose, then the director would certainly know a lot about, you know, that specific, the very, very specifics about that instrument. But what if you're, what if you're combining all these forces? Um, I mean, is that, a, are you required to make sure you're covering all your bases with everyone who might know something specific about every instrument that's happening? I mean, if. That's nice, and it'd be great to be able to do that, but, I mean, you're a human being at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> to me, talking about um, the activity you were talking about, Dave, where you're, you're become involved, uh, you know, the idea of a non-specialist doing a variety of things and then having that evaluated by people who are specialists. I don't think I don't fear being judged by the specialist. To me, it seems like an amazing opportunity uh, for the specialist to, to be um, sort of obligated to learn how to do their field in a new and exciting way. An example would be quote professional photographers. Um, the the internet and the prevalence of really high quality cameras that can overcome a lot of photographic. Um, sort of issues that in the past you would have to have a high level of specialized knowledge to overcome, you know, and I'm not going to get into the, te the specifics, but there's a lot of stuff in photography that to make a picture look a certain way, you had to know what you were doing a lot more 25 years ago than you do now. But um, uh, the cheap cameras and easy uh, sharing of photography has made the And the Instagram job. filters. Yeah, and Instagram <laughs> filters. <laughs> Which are all things that you can just, you know, you can look at what Instagram is doing and describe it as you could make that look that way by doing X, Y, and Z in Photoshop, which is exactly the same thing. It's just a preset, sort of. Well, um, I think this speaks, Sam, this is like the same thing of, of like someone who's making a very sophisticated computer program, coding it in machine language or something like that. Like, no one's yeah. doing that today. Yeah. I mean, like, if you use uh, Maximus P or PD... Um, it's a lot, it's a, you know, the graphic interface makes it a lot easier to do things that in the past you would have had to know the nitty gritty of ones and zeros to make that happen. Does that mean that the thing that you make is any less cool? It's, it's as cool as it is, 
but to me, uh, like the example of the photographer or the coder, it inspires that specialist to do things, to reach even further and do things in a different way. It's sort of like uh, unintentional collaboration, you know. You, when you filter your thinking through the, the mind of someone else who has a different way of thinking about things, it's, uh, well, as Sir Ken Robinson would say, that is really the nexus of creativity. Um, and I'm in complete agreement with that. Well, let's see what you saying, Dave, this makes me think of something that I wrote about a while ago. When you were saying, oh, as a composer or a performer, I'm being asked to do something that's totally outside my comfort zone, is that what you were saying? And, um, and I think when we're asked to do that, there's this syndrome, I call it the how dare you syndrome. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Oh, that men have slaved for centuries to be able to write this music. Like you think you can write this music? Like you've got to get back in your studio and work for at least another twenty years before anyone's allowed to hear anything you've done. Or like, you didn't train as a playwright. Like, don't you dare write a monologue for your chamber music concert. Like, it just like how dare you, how dare you, like create something and think that you actually have something worthwhile to say. Um, I think classical music is really rife with that um, that syndrome of like I I'm not good enough. I've I've got to train with more masters. I've got to apprentice longer. I've got to work harder. And it's it's kind of an anti risk taking attitude that's really hard to break yeah. out. Yeah. Right. I think the establishment is starting to get over it in certain ways. And I think the most recent Pulitzer Prize winner for music composition is a good example. She doesn't even, Carolyn Shaw doesn't even describe herself as a composer. She kind of, and the way the piece that one was constructed is sort of like the way a band writes a piece. You know, she certainly came up with the, the bulk of the material, but then you workshop that with a bunch of your uh, collaborative partners and you come up with this thing. And that is not really what, you know, your typical Pulitzer Prize winner, that's not the formula that you think they're using. Um, and the fact that that piece won, and we discussed this when that when the show ha when that happened, but that to me is an inspiring and and uh, gives me hope for for people being able to take more risks in our field. And it's very person specific too. Like it's not. I I don't know if there's been a Pulitzer Prize that's like this, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning piece, I should say, that's like this, where it's not the kind of thing that you could just like pick up the score and easily perform with another eight people. Like it was written mm -hmm. for these people's specific vocal quirks and their their specific you know vocal acrobatics that they can do like there's a, some people in the ensemble that can do multiphonic singing and so there's multi multiphonic singing in those parts and there's some people in the ensemble who can yodel and there's yodeling in those parts um and and i i think you'd have to like really dig through your your you know digital musical rolodex to find an, another eight people capable of performing uh, uh, some of the, the parts of, of Carolyn Shaw's uh, piece. So I think that's a really interesting change. And I, it, it, it's, I think, a lot like, Ellen, the things that you're describing doing um, with your, your groups in Chicago is, like, there's not a lot of people in the world that have the, those skills, not just in playing instruments, but doing the other things that are required to to, to pull off some of those events. I feel like one other thing that's popping in my mind is the word vulnerability. Like when a performer gets up there and is like, I'm a violinist, but I'm going to do some acting today. I'm going to sing today. I'm going to hit some objects. I think that like is really cool for audiences, like for us to just be like safe and totally in control and an expert, like expertise is, is, I, don't know. I, I think seeing, seeing the performer or the composer in kind of a vulnerable position is super exciting as an audience member. Again, it could fail, but when it succeeds, it's, it's, I think it's way more, way more exciting. Well, I think it's yeah. it's 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 a, a risk taking for the audience too. Like as 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 embarrassing as it might be for a performer to fail, I think it's at least as embarrassing to be in the audience when that happens, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The job fair would be like that. I was like, people are going to be cringing. It's going to be so awkward. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, speaking of risk taking. 
Um, there was an article in, uh, well, it was actually an interview and a sort of a transcript or a, a truncated transcript of the interview on NPR this week, uh, talking to the conductor of the St. Louis Symphony, David Robertson, about, uh, the, well, the title of the piece was, Why Are American Orchestras Afraid of New Symphonies? And this is sort of a tag along with the court story we covered briefly last week by David Putz. Kevin Putz. Kevin Putz. Kevin Putz. Uh, but um, talking about why don't, well, talking about the concept of, quote, the great American symphony and why don't more new symphonies get performed, um, and to me it's, it's risk-taking, you know. Um, of course, us sitting here discussing our new music collective taking risk is a totally different thing between someone who is uh, directing an orchestra and has a board of directors and all the other infrastructural elements that they're beholden to but to me, that's the key, is it's risk-taking. If you play one of the, you know, great 50, as, as it's put sometimes, you know you're going to be pretty safe. And at least the bulk of the people who come to symphony concerts are going to be perfectly happy with those pieces. Right. And, and that's something uh, that Robertson talks about in that, in that piece, is the, the, one of the biggest challenges is really from a marketing standpoint is how do you explain to people that this is a worthwhile concert when you go see um you know a, when you go to an orchestra concert it's billed as the 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 performance of Tchaikovsky 6 or something but there's like three or four other pieces on the program but it's really Tchaik 6 that people are there for mm -hmm. and you it's really hard to build a, a concert marketing plan around something that nobody's heard of before uh and he he gives some specific examples that he's experienced with the st louis symphony and that he always like gets kind of the the look when he brings in the idea to do something um like even adams that we think of as you know kind of a a, a superstar in in our little universe is, is like nobody to most of the symphony's subscribers right um something else that's addressed in that piece and, and to me this is something that we don't want music directors to put their jobs at risk or anything certainly but being being willing to take a little more risk can can help out because a music director is somewhat of a tastemaker um, and that's the exact word they use in the piece um so if you know, a good conductor is the kind where people in the community know who that person is. They have some kind of a relationship. They typically do some sort of community outreach. So you're trying to develop a community relationship, and those people will trust you. And if you take that responsibility seriously and want to be an advocate for new music, I think that they will respect you as a tastemaker to a degree. You know, certainly uh, a whole concert of new pieces is, is probably not going to why? Because the people are going to want to hear a war horse at least once a concert. Um, the one thing that really got in my grill over this piece, though, that, that is, a, is a, an analogy that people make sometimes that it just doesn't work, in, in my opinion, is comparing the idea of writing a new symphony with writing a novel. Um, if, you, if you write a novel and you want to get some sort of industry feedback, only one person has to read it. So the total, uh, uh, you know, labor demand is one person, but for a symphony, it is nowhere near that. Um, so it's it's not a useful analogy to me. Like being willing to write an experimental novel um, is not the same kind of thing as being willing to write an experimental symphony, in my opinion. Not a useful analogy. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, so you mentioned that that you you think these music directors should be taking more risks and and you said you don't want to risk their jobs and I think that there's there's what uh, an experimental novel like you said is is in, there's there's not as many people that are dependent on the success of that one novel as there are on the success of an orchestra season mm -hmm. um, though at the same time I like people like. David Robertson and Marin Alsop and Michael Tilson Thomas and Gustavo Dudamel are like their jobs are pretty safe. I don't know what they how many crazy things they would have to try to program before that would change. And if if 
it did change, I don't think any of those people would be employed for more than like a minute and a half. Um, yeah, but the people, the the audience in those cities are used to hearing um, more adventurous programs. Right. I mean, these, like these guys have taught over the course of several seasons, right? Yeah, I mean, right. like it's a big event. It's a big event when the gospel according to the other Mary happens. Like that's that's a sold out thing. Yeah. You know, um, and and these these cities and and the the culture that is that is gravitated around these organizations. I've really come to expect that, like, sort of sense of adventurous programming. I mean, I, I don't think I, – I think there are certain orchestras, you know, kind of like the B-list orchestras or what have you. I mean, like, they're more <laughs> – The B-list orchestras? <laughs> Why don't you go diss everybody in the in, in the world, Patrick? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not necessarily – uh, regional. All right, not, regional. Not, not everybody gets to deal with Boozy on a high level. <laughs> right? Not everybody can just call up Boozy and Hawks. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um I mean like so certainly your smaller organization is gonna it, typically will have to program a bit more conservatively. I mean like the larger organizations that do have a lot of funding, I mean they can kind of take a take a risk and create a a plan around the new programming. I mean like they have the luxury of of these cultural capitals that just want to see something new. Yeah, I always just felt like, my God, trying to get an orchestra to innovate is just really hard. It's like dragging a super heavy object across a room versus like a small one. I mean, it's just, there's so many moving parts. Um, I adore David Robertson so much and like if I, from what I can gather because I've played some concerts in St. Louis and kind of hung out with music like concert goers there um, there's a chamber festival there called the Gesher Festival that I've been part of and people seem pretty into what he's doing I didn't I haven't read the article Sam that you brought up um, but I wonder if if the orchestra I wonder about the emphasis on the orchestra as the institution that's going to bring contemporary music forward. And maybe that's a moot point because at this point it isn't. Obviously it's it's small ensembles that are that are kind of things a lot. Um, just really it's just really, really hard. And I almost wonder, like maybe perhaps the opposite of what you were saying, Patrick, like could the smaller orchestras do it because there's less baggage or there's like less investment i don't know i mean it would have to be done so well it always has to be done really well um i agree with that that's what i was thinking for a smaller orchestra there's less at stake um but who knows none of us are are uh music directors so well that's an interesting thing about robertson is is that he is involved in a lot of that stuff in st louis he actually does get involved in 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 chamber music in st louis which i don't know of a lot of big orchestra music directors that are involved in um, in chamber music, the way he is, uh, yeah. well, you know, he, he on on some of those complicated conductor required chamber pieces. I've seen his name on the program conducting chamber music in St. Louis, which is very cool. Yeah, I mean, um, I I I don't think that's too uncommon though. I mean, like the Boston Symphony has Boston Symphony chamber players, and then L.A. has a um, like a chamber series. Seattle, incredible place is really doing a lot with well i think um, these are independent of the st louis symphony organization oh oh like completely uh, oh not um not yeah. anything to do with the orchestra yeah okay yeah um i think ellen has to leave soon um so i want to move on there's one uh some quick news we need to cover um the concert master of the minnesota orchestra Stephanie Arado has resigned, and we're not going to get into any more about that because anytime you want some analysis, we'll just get Drew on the show again. Um, <laughs> no, so instant replay on the Minnesota Orchestra. Yes. Yeah. So, With the so, Telestrator, right? Yes. Like John Madden. Yeah, concerns continue for the new uh, Minnesota Orchestra. Uh, Dave, I want you to show a quick video of this, though, uh, the Wikipedia thing. It's not a big like new music thing. I just thought it was really interesting, and I didn't realize that um, that much editing was done to Wikipedia. Oh, 
why don't you explain what's going on here? So this is being generated in real time, the animation and the music, by tracking Wikipedia edits. Each one of these little things that pops up is an edit to Wikipedia. Um, all over the world? All over the world. Well, just the English Wikipedia. But English Wikipedia edits from all over the world. Um, and you can change it to be a different language Wikipedia. But um, you can see that different colors refer to whether a person is registered or not. White is unregistered, green is registered, and purple is by a bot. Um, another interesting thing is that I, th I think the bells are additions and the strings are deletions. So you can hear whether people are more adding or more subtracting based on the timbres. So anyway, that's that's listening to Wikipedia. Not not particularly adventurous sounds, lots of very safe kind of uh, uh, pentatonic-y sounds, but an interesting project nonetheless. I feel so. really emotional after watching that. <laughs> yeah, it kind of, but it puts it in perspective. You know, this many, these many people around the world coming together to edit this one thing. Yeah, I mean, and that's that kind of easy collaboration has kind of been the theme of the day show. You know, people can get together more easily now than in the history of mankind, humankind, I should say. Right, Ellen? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good. No. <laughs> Yeah, and Wikipedia is a perfect example of kind of throwing expertise a bit out the window. Um, right. Or the definition. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's wrap this uh, in the interest of not making Ellen late for anything. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this week, Ellen. It's been it's been great talking to you. A great conversation. Thank you, you guys. Really what like you it. Got, what do you got coming up? Um. I guess the next thing that I have coming up is Chicago Q Ensemble is doing a show, the big thing that I'm thinking about right now, we're doing a show in November. It's going to be called Three Sided, and it, it is going to involve, it's kind of a three-woman show um, with music by Marcos Balter, Andrew Norman, and Beethoven, and that's happening in Chicago in November at Constellation, which is a really cool venue hosting a lot of the kind of collaborative stuff we talked about today. Awesome. Well, uh, any you're welcome back anytime. We had, a, we had a great time talking to you. That's going to do it for uh, this week's show. If you would like to watch this show live, we, we stream the show at soundnotion.tv slash live around 11 a.m. Eastern time each week. Um, so you can join us there in the chat room. Um, if you're watching this after the fact and you'd like to comment on it, you're welcome to do that as well. We encourage any comments on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN, where you can also find links to uh, all the stuff we've been talking about with Ellen and with the other things, uh, the other stories that we've we mentioned this week. Um, you can also, if you have any comments, connect with us on all the social media places. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can like us on Facebook. You can uh, follow us on Twitter. We're at Sound Notion as a group. I'm at Dave McDow. Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. Sam is at Housegoy. Ellen is at, un, at Ellen underscore McSweeney. Um, and uh, Nate, who is not with us this week, is at a Nate tree. Um, let's see. Real quick, Dave. Yes. Um, next week, I want to remind all of our faithful fans that the new music quartet Cadillac Moon Ensemble is going to be on. It's a quartet formed in 2007 of flute, violin, cello, and percussion. So that's next week. Interesting. Cool. Well, that's something to look forward to. I, I got those dates mixed up. I thought it was somebody else. Thank you for reminding me. Um, you can subscribe to this show and all our shows at Sound Notion TV in the iTunes store. And you should definitely subscribe to this show and uh, Streamers and Punches if you're into film music. We just recorded uh, an interview for the next episode of Streamers and Punches with composer Bear McCreary, who uh, you may know for his work on Battlestar Galactica, the um, Walking Dead, awesome. uh, future work on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, he's Emmy nominated for uh, Da Vinci's Demons. Uh, so great guy and great composer. And it was a really fun conversation. So look out for that coming up in the next week or two on uh, Streamers and Punches. Um, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gula and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching or listening. We appreciate you audio people as well. And we'll see you back next week.